Chapter one skills review uh, is very similar to the chapter one material for this module or this week. And it's really just a sort of simplified examples that are relatively similar to the logical fallacies and categorical propositions and uh, deductive reasoning arguments that we'll see in chapter one. So the whole point of chapter one is essentially critical thinking and interpreting logic from the language of statements. Now, um, the first component that we'll look at in our skills this week is logical fallacies. So we'll have a list of fallacies in the textbook that we can refer to as we work through these problems. Uh, and that's uh, probably recommended on how to do so. Most of the time, these questions will be a, a matching type of question or a multiple choice, something like that. So uh, let's read through these fallacies and we'll best match each fallacy with the or fallacy that occurs in each statement with the fallacy listed below. So our first statement I hear is, when asked about their public health policy, a political candidate answers by claiming that their public health policy is a small threat compared to their opponent's social justice policy, which is weak on crime. Okay, so that's a mouthful. Um, but let's see, the gist of this is where a public, political candidate was asked about a public health policy, and they say that their public health policy is a small threat compared to their opponent's social justice policy. So this looks so far to be a red herring. A red herring is where we would distract from the point of the question. In other words, instead of answering in response to uh, their public health policy, this politician has decided to uh, cast a light on their opponent's social justice policy, which is somewhat irrelevant to the question. So it's, it looks like I is going to match with this red herring argument. And we might amend our choices as we go through. There might be a better fit for a, for a red herring. So uh, Roman numeral two, we've got in response to a city politician's decision to support changes in the procedure and role of police in their community, critics claim that a vote for this politician is a vote for anarchy. So that sounds a little extreme, right? So we've got a city politician who wants to support changes in uh, the role of police. And on the other side, we've got people claiming that this is anarchy. So it sounds like we've uh, sort of exaggerated our opponent's position exaggerated their argument or their stance. If that's the case, um, the critics have created a straw man, an exaggerated argument, and they're beating it up now. Right? In other words, they've, they create an argument that's pretty easy to defeat. In other words, they're saying that this is uh, this, this political, that our rival or the person we're criticizing is, is basically you know, an anarchist. So uh, nobody wants an anarchist for a leader or most people don't. So this is an easy thing to defeat. A straw man is an easy argument to defeat. Okay, a former president once said, you're either with us or against us. And this one falls in nicely to excluded middle. Um, another option here, um, there's another one called limited choice. This argument kind of falls into a limited choice scenario either. Excluded middle is uh, saying that there's no middle ground, right? You're either with us or against us is a classic statement for excluded middle. You can be ambivalent, right? You can be somewhat undecided um, rather than being with someone or against someone. And also that it kind of falls into limited choice as well, right? It's assuming that there are only two ways to be rather than somewhere in the middle perhaps. So that's uh, fallacy types. Typically, again, you'll have a, a statement and then you'll have a few fallacy types to choose from and you can best match the fallacy type to the statement. So the next thing we wanna look at is categorical statements. A categorical statement is one that uh, places one set inside another or one group inside another one or categorizes something as a part of a larger category or not. So we'll see a few examples of this. So they ask us to draw a Venn diagram to represent the relationship of each set of, of, each set of statements, use circles for sets and X for any individual mentioned in the statements. So to clear this first one, to make it a little easier to see what's going on here. We'll usually start with this empty rectangular box and 
um, we're reading here, all college freshmen are under 20 years old. So all S R P. Okay, so all college freshmen are under 20. Okay, so it doesn't matter the truth of this statement right now. We just want to break down the logic of that in terms of uh, sets and, and draw this as a Venn diagram. Well, here's our outer set. So all S R P is a way to think about this. I haven't gotten to the second statement yet, but we'll get there. All S R P. These are in the notes for chapter one, how to break these down, but this is a good introduction. So the larger group is P. Everything that is an S is a P, right? That means that P might have more in it than just S. Okay, so the larger set is the one that follows after R, so under 20. Okay, so I'll put under 20 to, to indicate the larger set. And then all college freshmen are under 20 years old. So that means that if, if an individual is a college freshman, they're in this set, and that set, according to this first statement, it's a categorical statement telling us that the category of freshmen are all in the category of under 20 years old. We can label this inner set. And that matches the logic of the statement, the categorical statement, all SRP. Okay, now the last thing they say is Sam is a college freshman. So let's call Sam X, as they uh, indicate in the instructions above. This is Sam. Sam is a college freshman. So without any sort of doubt, we know that we can place Sam's X clearly inside the freshman circle. That's given to us in the second premise or the second statement. And that concludes that. Um, we've placed the freshman set in the under 20 set and it pretty firmly places Sam, um, or very clearly places Sam in the college freshman set. One thing we might be able to to uh, deduce, and this is what we'll do later, is that if Sam is in this college freshman set, then necessarily, thanks to this, the logic given in the first statement, necessarily Sam is under 20. Sam has to be in the outer set because Sam's in the freshman set, and the first statement has established this relationship between these two sets, the inner and the outer. Now, whether or not the premises are true, namely, this one that all college freshmen are under 20, um, that's um, a question for valid or soundness of the argument. And that's something we'll see in the actual chapter one notes. Okay, so to continue with our categorical statements, we have a premise, all instructors on campus wear face masks. And then the second premise is Robin wears a face mask. So let's start with the first, all S, all instructors, wear face masks. So all instructors are people who wear face masks if we want to write it as all SRP. So all instructors, the first one is the smaller set and it is inside the larger set of masks. Right? All instructors are people who wear face masks or all instructors are mask wearers. Okay, Robin wears a face mask. So we've made an X for Robin. Now, the thing that we have to be very careful of is we, Robin, since the face mask is the outer set, Robin could be out here and not be an instructor. It's not clear whether or not she's an instructor or not, or he's an instructor or not. Robin could be inside this inner set, right? It's either one. So that we want to place the X in the most general possibility there is. And since it's not clear that Robin's in face mask and that only the mask set or and not the instructor set or in the instructor set, we place it on the boundary, place it on the boundary right here. And then we can say that, well, we know that Robin must be inside this set of mask wearers, but we don't know whether or not Robin's an instructor. So when we place an X on a boundary like that, um, that includes that most general possibility of being an instructor or not. And note from these two premises, we cannot conclude that Robin's an instructor or not. Um, just because they wear a face mask. Okay, and above, we could do that. We could conclude that Sam is under 20 based on the logic given by these two statements. Now, again, soundness is the last question as to whether or not we should accept that first premise, but we're only concerned with the logic in, in, at this point. So third, uh, no DMV offices are open. And the second premise, 
Lauren's office was open today. So the first statement tells us this, no DMV offices. So here's DMV offices and here are offices that are open. Since none of the DMV offices were open, these sets don't have any overlap. If they did, there would have been an, an, a DMV office that was open and that would violate this statement, okay? Lauren's office, we'll use that as the X, was open today. That X is placed cleanly in open offices. And that describes this situation. It's not always nested sets, they're not always inside one inside the other. Um, so in this case, we read it as no SRP. In other words, no DMV offices are open offices. That's a nice interpretation. You might have to rephrase some of the language sometimes. And that's some of the difficulty in logic and language. It's just converting language into logic. Now, our last exercise involves categorical reasoning. And this is a essentially deductive arguments. And we're only concerned with the validity of these so far. Uh, we're not concerned with the soundness. In other words, whether or not uh, these, these uh, statements are true on their surface or in reality. Um, what we're concerned with is the logical structure and if we followed a logically valid pathway. So let's see a couple examples to maybe clarify that. We're given a statement that says, if all ducks are birds, then all birds are ducks. Okay, so the first part of this is our premise. If all ducks are birds, and then we're concluding, all birds are ducks. Okay, so it's nice to be able to split an if then apart to recognize first a premise on the left here and a conclusion on the right. It doesn't always follow premise conclusion order. It could be a conclusion premise. It could be since all birds are ducks, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, it could be all birds are ducks since all birds are, or all ducks are birds. And that would be writing this conclusion premise first. Anyway, we don't have that situation so we can just look cleanly at this. Now, our first statement gives us our set relation. All ducks are birds. If we have an if, we're saying, if we make this assumption, if we assume that all ducks are birds, and then we can make some kind of conclusion from there. Well, all ducks are birds is given by this categorical uh, representation in Venn diagrams. If it's a duck, then it's a bird, right? So that's how they fit this together. Okay, all, all ducks are birds, all S are P. S is the smaller set inside the larger set of P, once again, matching what we did on the previous page. Now, their conclusion is that all birds are ducks. But I know we could think by example, that's not true, but it's very important to not do that at first and, and realize that it doesn't mean that it, when we look at these two sets, we realize there could be an X in here. There could be a bird that's not a duck based on the logic alone, not from reality. And that's the trickiest part with these problems is not to let your, your, your realistic experience um, cloud your judgment here. Uh, just because all ducks are birds, it doesn't necessarily mean that every bird is a duck. And that's from logical validity, not again, real life experience. So it doesn't, the premise does not ensure the conclusion, right? In other words, the, the conclusion does not necessarily follow from the premise. And the reason for that is this set's smaller and it's left room for something to fit in here. And the statement really, really does leave that room and, and we can imagine it's there. We can't conclude necessarily that this is the case. So this is not logically valid because the conclusion does not necessarily follow from the premise. So it's not logically valid. Okay, we could fix it though. We could fix this to be a logically valid statement and a, a one valid version, there are probably several, would be this. If all ducks are birds, we start with the same premise. If all ducks are birds, then some birds are ducks. That is logically valid because we can say that some birds, well, they're, they're ducks fits inside birds. So some birds are ducks. There's at least one bird that's a duck. Okay, so that's a logically valid statement that the conclusion, this portion of the statement follows necessarily from, from this premise off to the left here. Okay, so one more, um, if no student is a teacher, so we're starting with if, so that is our premise again on this side, premise on the left, then 
Here's our conclusion, no teacher is a student. Okay, so let's split this apart. The first statement, if no student is a teacher, so they're saying assume that no student is a teacher. So the set of teachers and the set of students have no overlap, okay? So we've got that set up well, then our conclusion is no teacher is a student. Well, in other words, there's no X in teachers that's also in students. And that's based on the two sets that we've drawn here, teachers and students, they don't have any overlap. This is logically valid. There's no way to have an X in teachers that's also in students. So we can conclude that this is a logically valid um, categorical reasoning or statement of categorical reasoning. So the argument in this case is valid. Now, the last step you'll learn in section 1C or D, I believe, in, in chapter one, one of the later two sections, is how to judge soundness as well. And sound and valid all need to be together for an argument to be sound overall. So once we can judge the, the logical validity of a statement, then it's left to us to determine the truth of the premises, and that's how we'll determine soundness. But this is the hardest step, and that's why it's emphasized in these skills slides and notes.